just want to add to uh, the reason I, I prayed for a guy named Ralph Drollinger as capital ministries. Ralph played for the Dallas Mavericks, and he is trying to put a chaplain in every capital in the United States. And I think right now they have 13 chaplains in 13 different capitals in the United States, and they have one in D.C. So uh, some of the information I get is from him when we find out who's getting saved, who's reaching out to the ministry. So they are having a, a big impact on our government. So lift them up. Ralph is seven foot two. He's an easy guy to spot. And it also makes him a big target. So be with them and be with the ministry that they are uh, have, have been going through for the last few years. They're doing really well. But they are in D.C. specifically uh, trying to uh, maintain and establish our Christian values in government. So keep them in prayer. They're going through uh, a lot of challenges, as you would not be surprised today, I know. So, okay. We are in Mark, we're going to finish up Mark chapter 6 this morning. Um, we're going to just look at verse 53. To, just to review, we remember that uh, a couple specific things. That we know that the apostles were on a ship in a storm in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And I just, just a couple things that really stuck out to me that we talked about last week, but I want us to remember. Number one, Jesus knew that they were in the ship. Two, he was on the mountain watching over them and praying for them. And three, when he realized that they had been struggling for a certain amount of time, it's, it's just great and comforting to know that the Bible says that Jesus went out to them. It's an application that we can, uh, it's something we can apply in our own lives. And to know that God is always watching, that in 1 John chapter 2, Jesus is always interceding for us. And that, and that if we ever get to a point where we can't handle it any longer, he's not far away. He's walking alongside us and he, he will help us when we need that. I just, that really spoke volumes to me personally as we were looking over that portion of scripture here in Mark chapter 6. So, just to, just to recap that very briefly. So let's go to verse 53 of Mark chapter 6. And it says this, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, the people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages, towns, countrysides, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. Again, another recap. Let's remember there was, a, there was some controversy over where and how Jesus got to the place he was and where he ended up. Because some portions say he went to Bethsaida. Some say he went to Capernaum. Some say he went to Genesaret. And as, we drew, as I drew last week, remember, he started here. They got into the boat at Bethsaida. They went over to Genesaret. This is a region. And he ended up preaching in Capernaum and ministering there. So it's not a controversy or a contradiction. It's one that's very popular that people want to bring up. And that's the answer. Basically, they're all included. And so they did end up in the county of Genesaret. And they taught in Capernaum. Okay. So let's take a look at this. This is, I wrote up here, that we're going to see a tradition in Mark chapter 7. We're going to advance there in a minute. And then we have this prosperity message. Has anybody ever heard of the prosperity message? Name it, claim it, believe it, you get it. Does that work out for everybody? The park, no, <laughs> thanks, Jamie. The, the parking lot would either be full of big tractors and stuff like that, or Bugattis, one or the other, because they are big trucks. Stu, what would you be driving if you could have anything you wanted? What? Mustang Cobra. Mustang Cobra, yes. Like a Shelby or a... All right, I'm with you, brother. Absolutely. Have you wished for that enough? Prayed enough? Thought about it? You know, if you claim it, it's coming. Right. It'll be in the parking lot one day with your name on it. <laughs> but this is what's going on. What we'll do here, because we have to kind of see how this veers off. There's a couple of, of uh, divisions here. Number one, this, this is going to go over to John chapter 6, just briefly. So go to John chapter 6. And you'll see in verse uh, 22, it says, The next day, remember Mark just said, The crowds came to him. The next day... The crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore, Mark chapter, or excuse me, John 6, verse 12, uh, 22, 
The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there. They knew the disciples' boat. They knew Jesus' boat. It was the only one there at the time when he was ministering. And when they came out, they realized it was gone. But Jesus didn't get into it, but then he had gone away alone. In other words, we knew that he had gone to the mountain to pray. Now, the people were looking for Jesus. The key here is they're not looking for Jesus to be their Lord and Savior and to worship Him. They're looking to Jesus to be their food source. What, what, what is popular is that Jesus' ministry at this point has reached the apex of his two years currently of ministry. He's become very popular. People have realized if you just touch him, remember Mark chapter 5, verse 27, if you just touch the hem of his garment, you'll be healed. Not only healed physically, but mind, body, spirit, soul. You'll be healed. And so that rumor or legend of the lady who touched the hem of his garment and got around, and now he's fed 25,000 people. His ministry is at a peak. He's huge. He's, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a rock star, for lack of a better term. So people are now seeking him out, but not for the right reasons. They're seeking him out for what we refer to or call for the prosperity gospel. They're seeking Jesus for what they can get. And so, then if you look here, it says that Jesus didn't enter, but they had gone away alone. Verse 23, then some boats from Tiberias. Now, word of Jesus has spread all the way from here where he fed the 5,000, all the way down here to Tiberias. This is where these people are coming from. They're going to travel about 13 miles by boat to find Jesus here because word had got there. They're going to find out he's not there, and then everybody here is going to get in those boats, and they're going to head over here to Genesaret to follow Jesus. Again, not because they want him to be Lord and their Savior and the Son of God or Messiah, but because they're looking for uh, his blessings and what they can get from him. So verse 24, once the crowd realized that Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. Now, I'm just going to point out a few things not to go through this chapter line by line, but let's look at this. Verse 25, when they found him, and this is where you have the prosperity people. In a minute, we're going to talk about the traditional people. But right now, the prosperity people. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? How'd you get here? You were on the other side just a minute. They don't realize you walked across the water. And secondly, you didn't ask us to leave. We're not done with you yet. Isn't that interesting? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the food that I made. They're looking for a food source. And I'm just going to go through this quickly. Verse 28, then they asked him, what must we do to do the works of God? Not, will you be my Lord and Savior? Will you forgive me of my sins? But what must we do to get more from you? And that's in verse 28. And then verse 30, what must we, what miraculous sign will you give us again? Give us, we had dinner with you last night. Give us breakfast this morning. That's not too much to ask, is it? But this is what they're asking for. Give us food again. Give us another miraculous sign. And this is how we know they're referring to the food. Because what we do, our forefathers ate manna in the desert. And under, in other words, we don't just want dinner. We don't just want breakfast. We want a perpetual, miraculous source of food for the rest of our lives. We don't want you. We just want what you can give us. So, <clears throat> and then we'll get down to verse 34. And they said to him, give us this bread. They're demanding the bread. And Jesus is declaring, listen, you're not seeing the big picture. They are temporarily focused. Temporal and the temporal. They're looking to fulfill the flesh. They're looking to fill their bellies. And Jesus is trying to fill their heart and to fill their soul. He is eternally focused. And so he's like, you need to follow me, basically. I'm not going to, you know, paraphrasing here. And then uh, you're going to see in a few minutes, he, instead of giving them food, he gives them a sermon. I am the bread of life. Come to me and you will be filled. And it says here, you know, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And in verse 66 of, Mark, of John chapter 6, it says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and followed him no longer. We gave you a list. We're still hungry. We gave you a demand. Moses fed his followers from heaven. 
Well, Moses didn't do it, did he? It was God that fed the, the wanderers, uh, the Israelites. But you're not listening to us. If you're not going to give us this, we're done with you. Isn't that something? Is this how the prosperity message works? I didn't get my Mustang Cobra, Jesus. I'm done with you. I know you wouldn't do that, Stu, but... But there are people that do that. I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed for a miracle. And I, when I was in business, I would meet guys that prayed for business, prayed for, for the, to get into the black a certain time of season and make money, and it didn't happen. And I forget God. I don't need Him. He doesn't answer my prayers. He don't hear me. We cannot take a recipe to God and say, fill it, or a shopping list to God and say, fill it. This is not what Jesus wants. This is what we want. Give us what we want. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you what you need. What you need is a Savior. What he's saying is, I'd rather give you this message, save you from your sins, than send you on a religious path that sends you to hell with your belly full. How disappointed are they going to be? And Jesus knows this. And when they get to hell, they're full. And they're like, oh, this is good. And they realize they're damned forever. By the way, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in hell. I don't want to talk about that. Anymore. But anyway. So now we have the real follower. Simon Peter answers him in verse 68 and says, after Jesus asked him, do you want to leave also? And Simon Peter becomes the spokesman of the 12 here, and you'll see him continue that in the book of Acts. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? He's starting to get it. The disciples are starting to get it. You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil. So twelve, he speaks for the twelve. Everybody walks away. Really, he only has eleven, because we know Judas is going to betray him. So, the people come and make him king. You fed us. We're tired of the Roman government's oppression. Now we want a leader. We want you to feed us. We want you to take care of us. We've seen you heal. We've seen you raise the dead. Will you be our leader? We want to overthrow the Roman government. We have our guy. Let's make him king. And if you uh, if you look at verse 15, you'll see that. They wanted to make Jesus king by force, and he had to walk away before that happened. They wanted an earthly king. So this is the prosperity message. I want, I want, I want. If I don't get it, we don't want you. And that's what happens today. That's the, the damage or the, uh, the downside of the prosperity message. If you come in and you say, I want $100,000 this week, and it ends up in your mailbox, you're good. But what about the other 100,000 people that pray the same thing? I want to hit the lottery. What happens if they all hit the lottery at the same time? You got it. Amos and Bruce Almighty. I got 17 cents. Didn't work out. But anyway, this is the kind of thing, the downside of the prosperity message. If I don't get it the way I want it, then it's no good. It didn't happen. I'm not following this Jesus. He doesn't answer me. So let's go back to Mark chapter 7. <clears throat> now, we've talked about the prosperity followers. We're following Jesus for food, hopefully for a rebellion. Maybe he'll rise up and be their king. He says no, and they walk away. And then so in comes the Pharisees. We all love the Pharisees, don't we? I want to really look at this closely. So verse uh, chapter 7, verse 1, the Pharisees. Some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem, this is significant. These weren't your fly-by-night little scribes and guys out in the towns trying to preach little messages. These are your authorities coming from Jerusalem. He's qualifying them here. These are the big heavy hitters. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law came from Jerusalem. It's a big deal. They came from Harvard University. Here they come. And they gathered around Jesus. And saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. And then you'll see a parenthesis here, and we'll stop there just for a minute. Here come the heavy hitters. Jesus is healing. He's raising the dead. People are getting saved and baptized. The blind can see. The lame can walk. And... The deaf can hear. I'm trying to think of all the things. The message is being preached. The gospel is being preached. Here come the big heavy hitters in the religious system. And what are they worried about? Your hands aren't clean. Do we ever have that happen in the church today? And I wrote that down. Isn't it interesting that people will attack your ministry? 
They'll attack your methods. They'll attack your results. Eventually they get to the word and they start attacking the word. And you'll see this progression in a minute. Forget that the dead are being raised. Forget that the deaf can hear. The blind can see. The poverty. The people that don't eat are being fed. You didn't wash your hands. That's a big deal. The preacher didn't wear a tie on Sunday morning. Uh-oh. Somebody wore a baseball cap in the church. I don't know. Think of these things that we look at. I saw a girl with a tattoo this morning. What is the church coming to? Forget that the fact that she's been saved, and, I, and I'm not picking on anybody in here. I've got tattoos. Anyway, some of us have them. But maybe last week she was a heroin addict shooting up and she got saved and got right with Jesus Christ and you're worried that she came to church with a tattoo. Shouldn't we be looking at the bigger picture that we no longer have a heroin addict in the streets? She's going to become a productive member of society. Maybe she has children. I was working with a family this week that adopted the seventh child from a girl who's a heroin addict. She has seven kids and can't take care of none. What about those children? We're worried about the ceremonial washing of hands. This is the big deal. The pastor wore jeans. Somebody wore a hat. Somebody had a tattoo. Somebody had too many earrings. Somebody, well, my daughter's got an earring in her, in her nose, but there ain't another kid that I know that wins souls like Casey. She's brought more purple to this church than I think most of us have for the last six years. And those kids were having, we have a Bible study at our house. As a matter of fact, we have a Bible study on Thursday night. There were 14 people there this week, and last week we baptized one of them. The kids are working, the neighborhood's working, and, and, and you know what? None of us are normal. I might have forgot to wash my hands before I started preaching. And some of the reason that we see here is because there was a thought in the Talmud, the 6,200 pages of extra gospel that the priest wrote that said, while you sleep at night or while you go through the towns, you might touch somebody unclean. And the worst part of it is that a demon may have sat on your hand when you weren't looking. <laughs> this is the thought behind this. I'm giving you the depth. If a demon sat on your hand while you weren't looking and you didn't wash your hands when you eat, then you stuffed the demon in your mouth and you ate him. Now he's inside your body. Anyway, that's some of the tradition behind this situation. They're eating with unwashed hands. But let's take a look at the condition of the heart of the people and the spiritual leaders at this time. If we look at Hosea, uh, well, let's go to Amos first. Amos 2.6 says this, this is what the Lord says. For three transgressions of Israel, even for four, I will not revoke my judgment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. This is the corruption of the people. They trample on the heads of the poor as the dust of the earth. They push the needy out of their way. A man and his father resort to the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in a pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of the sanctioned. There's corruption. There's corruption in the priesthood. When you look at the end of the Bible in the Old Testament, there are four chapters committed to the corruption of the priest in the temple system in the final book of the Old Testament. Hosea 4.14 says, I will not punish your daughters when they prostitute themselves. Your daughters-in-law, when they commit adultery, because the men themselves go off with prostitutes. When you look at John chapter 4, and you look at John chapter 8, the lady caught in adultery and the woman who had five husbands, you can see why Jesus was able to push those attackers off and they left the oldest to the youngest, because they were as guilty as she was when they brought her to Jesus and said, what are you going to do about her? Here's your scripture. Because the men go off with prostitutes and make sacrifices with cult prostitutes. It's corrupt. He who is out without sin, let him throw the first stone. Amos 5.12 says, For I know your transgressions are many and your sins are innumerable. You oppress the righteous. You take bribes and you deprive the poor of justice at the gates. 
Micah 2, 9, I'm going through a few of these. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from their children forever. Now this occurs in the New Testament. Jesus addresses the priest in Matthew 23 and basically says, you rob widows. Here you go. You're robbing widows currently in Jesus' time. You're taking their homes. And this even says you're taking their uh, generational inheritance as well. The priests are corrupt. And in Luke Chapter 10, verse 46, here Jesus says, Beware of the scribes. They like to walk around in long robes. They love the greetings in the marketplace, the chief seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at the banquets. But they defraud widows of their houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. What are they saying? They're great at going through the motions. They're great at being traditionalists. They're great at being religious. What does Jesus call the priests? Whitewashed tombs. Isn't that interesting? Here they come. Jesus is healing the blind, healing the deaf, feeding the hungry, preaching the gospel. People are getting right with God, and they're worried about the washing of hands. And if we continue down here, it says... In parentheses, verse 3, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. And I read some of what MacArthur's comments were on this. He says they would make their hand like a fist and they would scrub it and scrub it and scrub it and make sure it was really clean. And this was a ceremonial washing to make sure there was no germs on it. This was not in the Bible. This was not in the law. This is in the Mishnah and the Talmud. If you would like that, I will order it for you. It's 6,200 pages and 37 volumes. What does God say? How do we fulfill the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. I'd rather go by that than the 37 volume set that the priest wrote. I gotta worry about washing my hands. I do wash my hands, by the way. And if you're in the bathroom, you don't wash your hands, and I see you, I'm not shaking your hand anymore. All right. Anyway, <clears throat> they hold the tradition, and you're gonna see this word tradition seven times in this portion of scripture. When they come from the marketplace, because they might have touched somebody that was unclean, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. And somebody had said, there is like a volume just for the washing of plates. Ladies, you better cover that for the next fellowship we have. One whole volume on how to wash plates properly. We know how important that is. Washing of cups, pitchers, and plates. So, let's look at this a little further. What happens here is tradition and religion begins to take over or take the place of the Word of God. The Talmud and tradition becomes the word and takes precedent. The word to supplement and protect the Bible becomes the tradition. And there is a pattern here. You see this extracurricular writing come into force and the priests are trying to uphold it. And, and what happens is the word of God gets washed out altogether. It's no longer the focus on the God. We're worshiping God in the wrong way. Joseph Smith did the same thing if you've ever heard of him. He wrote the Book of Mormon and said, read that first. Mary Baker Eddy writes Science and Health, the founder of, not Scientology, but Christian Science. Mary Baker Eddy says, if you read my book, it's just as good as the scriptures. You see where this is going? This happened in the, in the day when Jesus was on here. You didn't read the Talmud. You didn't read the Mishnah. This is what happens with cults. And I bring this up because we just were dealing with some Jehovah's Witnesses out here at Ray and Morty just recently. Charles Taze Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witness, writes the Watchtower, six-volume scripture study, and says it's just as good as the Bible itself. Why do we have to know the Word of God? Because if you don't know the Word of God, somebody's going to show up to your house with a watchtower and say, read this, it's just as good as the Bible itself. And if you don't know the difference, you're going to believe it. Judaism did the same thing. Islam said, read the Quran. Judaism again with the Mishnah and so on. What they say is the Bible doesn't matter. What does Jesus say about this tradition? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. You want a church gets such a bad reputation? Because we are hypocritical. I used to say there's no hypocrites in the church, but it's true. I'm 
a safe hypocrite. But isn't it true? Boy, they look good in the morning with their Sunday shoes and their Sunday tie and their Sunday suit. And they get out on Monday morning, you have no idea they went to church yesterday. It's true. I'd rather go to church and be with a few of them than go to hell and be with all of them. Hypocritical. The priests were hypocritical. So let's look at this. Jesus says, you honor me with your lips. You go through the motions. You have a great religion. Are we religious here at Sugar Tree Ridge? No. We are followers of Jesus Christ. Followers and imitators of Jesus Christ who read and know their Bible. We know the Word of God. But their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. Everything they do looks fantastic. But it's all vain. It's vanity and grasping for the wind. The teachings are rules taught by men. How many churches do we go in and they say, well, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. It has nothing to do with the scriptures. It's tradition. Jesus looks at them. He is indicting them when he says this. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding to the traditions of men. I'm healing people. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm feeding people and you're worried about the traditions of mankind. You don't like the way I do it. You don't like my methods. You don't like the results. And now you're attacking my father's word. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God. Verse 9, in order to deserve your own tradition. We don't need the law. We don't need the word of God. We have our own traditions. And then we talk about this Corbin. We'll go down here in verse 11. It's a gift that's devoted to God. People were supposed to take care of their parents. They're supposed to look out for them. And there was monies that were there if their parents were needed fed, they could feed them. There were, if they needed housed, the children could take care of that. But the priests say, if in one instant, one of the children says, this money I have will be devoted to God, that's it. Even if the parents need that money, they cannot have it. It's been devoted to God. And that's why Jesus is coming down on this. You can't revoke it. It's Corbin. It's been devoted to God. Sorry, parents, you're going to have to starve to death. This is to the extreme the priest took this. But you say of a man to his, um, verse 10, sorry. Jesus gives this example. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father and mother must be put to death. Pretty extreme. But you say that if a man says to his father and mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corbin. I can't help you anymore. I've already donated my money that I'm still having and I can use for my purposes. But when I die, it's already committed to the church. Mom and dad, I can't help you anymore. The priests made that ironclad law. And they say this is a gift devoted to God. Then you no longer let them do anything for their father and mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition. Tradition, tradition. Mark, chapter 7. Okay. Alright. Do you remember grow up, how many of us grew up in the 80s? How many of us grew up in the 60s? Am I hitting you yet wrong? Okay. Ed Sullivan, what did he do? when Elvis was on. They wouldn't show Elvis below the hips. Why? Because that was wrong. Can't show Elvis beyond the, be, be below the hips. That would be wrong. 80s. Don't listen to that 80s music. Throw out all your tapes. We didn't have CDs back then. Throw out all your 8-tracks. Get rid of it. It's the devil's music. You can't be a Christian if you listen to that music. You can't be a Christian. I mean, this is how bad it was. When I, when I was growing up. You can't be a Christian if you're dancing. Footloose. Alright. Oh, I'm touching some here. Here we go. Dancing, playing cards. And don't ever swear. And I don't agree with that either. But swearing isn't going to send you to hell. It doesn't make it right. It's not right. Don't get me wrong. That's not. we got to be different from the earth. About people of the earth or the world. Playing cards. We couldn't have them in our house when I was a kid. Because they were evil. They were used for gambling. Well, I never used them for we just had fun. We played old song. We played spades. Something like that. Look at all these traditions. No wonder there was a falling away in the 80s from the church. They were on prime time. And then all of a sudden, the pastor fell. The religious fell. The people making these rules fell. You gave me all these rules to follow, and now you can't even hold them up yourself. 
Now we've had this great departure from the Lord. The biggest one was probably in the 80s. All these rules, these traditions that we had to follow, and the people pushing them couldn't even do it themselves, and they fell, and here we are. The, that's why we have to be focused on Christ. I get criticized once here for laughing in the baptism. I was excited somebody was getting baptized. You believe another pastor wrote the church and said Rob is laughing in the baptism. When, since when has this become a fun time? Since when has this become sacrilegious? Isn't it supposed to be exciting when somebody gets saved? The angels in heaven rejoice when somebody gets right with God. I'm sorry I laughed in the baptism. I should have washed my hands. Do you see where I'm going? Listen, I'm just going to go to the end here, and I'm going to say these things. There's a thing here in Mark where Peter even says, I've never touched anything unclean in my life. And God says, whatever I have created, do not call it unclean. So I'm going to say this. Thank God for the cross. Thank God for the cross. And I was just praying as I was writing this down. I hope you can follow me. I hope I don't do too crazy. But the cross tears down this veil that the Jews put up. The cross tears down the veil that the religious put up. The cross tears down the veil that the traditionalists and legalists put up. The cross says, I have split the veil from top to bottom so that you personally have access to the Holy of Holies and you, however you are, God will take you, meet you where you're at, in the middle of the storm, wherever, and welcome you. The cross does that. Thank God for the cross. The cross tears the veil of tradition. The cross tears the veil of religion. The cross tears down the veil of racism. Why is there a problem? There's a departure from God. Racism? Whatever. I don't like it, but if they would go to the cross, realize that all men are created equal, tear down that veil real quick. The cross tears down the veil of hatred. The cross tears down the veil of violence. The cross obliterates the veil of sin. The cross obliterates the veil of shame. The cross tears down the veil of poverty. The cross opens the door to forgiveness. The world has got to quit being so legalistic and crazy and go to the cross because when you go to the cross, the veil is open and forgiveness comes in. Mercy comes in. Grace comes in. Hope comes in. Love comes in. Healing comes in. Help comes in. Equality comes in. And eternal life comes in. Forget about the traditions. Who cares? It's not going to get you to heaven. You can go to hell with your belly full and be religious. Or we can go to the cross. The cross opens the gates of heaven and crushes the gates of hell. The cross makes the demons shake and tremble. The cross marks the victory of heaven over sin, death, and the devil. Not traditions. Not rules. Not law. It's so easy to get occupied with the insignificance of tradition and rules. And lose focus on what really matters most. And it's the reason that Jesus Christ came here to preach the gospel and seek and save that which was lost. If you want to come to my house after working a hard day and eat with your hands unwashed, come on over. Pizza tastes just as good with cleaner, dirty hands. So my question is, as a believer, have we been to the cross? Everybody has a past. I don't want to know it. I don't want you to know mine. For 23 years, I lived like a heathen. I admit it. That's why I'm so smart. When my kids get a little crazy. I know where this is going. I'm cutting it off before it happens. I've been there. Some of you have been there. Maybe some of you are still there. Don't be condemned. The cross has ripped that veil, and Jesus is right there waiting for you. Are you carrying a book of rules, or are you carrying your cross? By the way, in Matthew 10, it says, you cannot follow Jesus Christ if you are not carrying your cross. And I just give you the example. The rules do one thing. The cross is light. The burden is easy. And we can't follow Jesus without carrying the cross. The cross obliterates tradition. The cross obliterates religion. 
The cross brings in grace, mercy, and love. And that's what we need to be. The cross brings in, John 19, 30, the finished work of Jesus Christ. When he shouted from the cross, it is finished. If you have been forgiven, you are forgiven. Go on. Don't live in sin any longer. And Jesus is not going to condemn you. We must meet at the cross. The cross is light. The cross is manageable. And we must carry, not rules, not tradition, not legalism, we must carry the cross if we're going to know and follow and become a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's pray.